The first answer is no. Well, there's quite a good reason why the Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats. Third class passengers were more likely to survive than second class passengers. If she was having a little race with her twin sister. There you are, now he's a girl and he can go. Welcome to History Hit. My name is Tim Moulton. I'm one of the world's leading experts on the Titanic. And today I'm going to answer a few of the most popular questions about the Titanic from Google. So here we go. Let's take a look at the first one. Was the Titanic real? Well, yes, she was real. It wasn't just a 1997 blockbuster movie from Hollywood by James Cameron. It was a real ship. It was made in Belfast in Ireland by Harland and Wolf, and very sadly, 1,500 people did actually die when it sank. Only 705 people survived, and it was one of the greatest maritime catastrophes in history. So, let's take a look at the next one. Was the Titanic built in Belfast or Liverpool? Well, this is actually a very good question because Titanic was registered in Liverpool. And in fact, on the stern, that's the back part of Titanic, it actually said Liverpool in very big yellow letters sort of cut into the back of Titanic. And that's because Titanic was owned by a steamship company called the White Star Line, and they were actually based out of Liverpool. But uh, Titanic was actually built in Belfast. That's where Harland and Wolfe uh, was. She was built by thousands of Irish labourers and they built everything in Belfast from the engines to the steel, uh, they forged it there and they created these great ships uh, over about a five year period. Was the Titanic the largest ship ever built? Well, no. Now Titanic was only 882 and a half feet long. So she was about the size of a small cruise ship, something like the Canberra, for example. But even when she was launched, she wasn't technically the largest ship in the world because she was the same size as her twin sister ship, the Olympic. But actually, the reason why they were able to say she was the largest ship in the world is that tonnage, which is how you measure the size of ships, is actually a measure of how much accommodation you have. And what they did is they slightly, um, I don't want to say re rearranged the deck chairs on the Titanic, but they slightly rearranged the cabins on the Titanic in order to give her more accommodation than Olympic. And that meant that Titanic was technically the biggest ship in the world in 1912. Was the Titanic unsinkable? Well, um, no, because she did sink in the end. Uh, but they did believe she was practically unsinkable. And the reason for that is that Titanic was subdivided into 16 watertight compartments. And the reason for that was that the White Star Line, her builders, really envisaged um, a couple of types of accident. So one type of accident is a collision at sea with another vessel. Now the worst point for that would be on a bulkhead, uh, which is basically a watertight wall in the ship, which would breach the two largest compartments either side of that. So Titanic was designed to float with any two of her largest compartments flooded, which would simulate the worst kind of collision that she could have. Alternatively, she was also built so that her first four watertight compartments could all be flooded in the event of a head-on collision with an iceberg or with land or with another vessel. Unfortunately, Titanic's weight and speed were such that when she hit this giant iceberg, it was 100 feet above the water. It was probably 800 feet below the water. It weighed millions of tons. And when she hit it, it damaged not just the first four, which she could have survived. It actually went into the fifth compartment. And that meant that Titanic was doomed, not because she wasn't built properly, but because the damage that the iceberg did was outside of what we call the design envelope of Titanic's hull. So now let's have a look at the next one. How many passengers were on the Titanic? Well, mercifully, Titanic was not full when she sailed. Uh, she was designed to take about 3,500 people. But in fact, when she set sail, there were about 2,227 people on board. But we have to remember that 900 of those were crew. Imagine the luxury, you've almost got 
one crew per every two passengers. And that was the kind of Edwardian luxury they were used to. And of course, they also had an enormous amount of people who weren't looking after the passengers, but were feeding the boilers. Titanic actually used 600 tons of coal a day. She had 24 boilers that had to be kept going 24 seven. Why were people traveling on the Titanic? Well, the answer is for different reasons. So first class may have been aristocratic or new money, and they may have been flitting between holidays in Europe. For example, Molly Brown and John Jacob Astor, the richest man in the world, uh, were holidaying together in Egypt. It was very popular for wealthy Americans to holiday on the continent, as they called it, in, in Europe, in the old world. So rich passengers in first class would have been holidaying and at leisure and doing leisure travel. Um, then the second class passengers would probably have been business people, often traveling alone. Perhaps they had to go and sell some perfumes in America, or as one passenger did, or perhaps they were on, on a diplomatic mission, um, or, or perhaps they were just going to set up a factory or, or, or build a new business out there. And then the third class people, they were really the working class of, of today. And what they were doing is they were in a different category altogether. They were leaving with their whole families and all their possessions and all their money. And they were off to start a new life in America because there were food shortages in Europe. Also, America was this vast country that was just opening up and you could be given or buy plots of land towards the west of America very, very cheaply. And so people felt they would escape the squalid, sometimes squalid conditions of Europe, the sometimes harsh conditions of Europe with lack of food, and they thought, this is the new world. America is the land of opportunity. We're gonna go and have a new life in America. And that's why they were on the Titanic. <laughs> were Jack and Rose real people? Well, there's two answers to that. The first answer is no, uh, they, were, they were actors. Um, but the uh, more interesting answer is that actually uh, Jack Dawson in the film, Rose's boyfriend and partner, um, is actually based on a real person called Jack Thayer. He was only 18 years of age when he went down with Titanic. And rather like Jack in the film, he actually ended up swimming in the water. And um, he was so close to Titanic when it sank that he actually noticed the ship actually breaking in half. And he did a drawing of it into parts, but he wasn't believed until a man called Bob Ballard from America discovered the Titanic in September, 1985. And he discovered her on the seafloor in two pieces. And that's when the world knew that Jack Thayer was telling the truth. Why was the Titanic going so fast? Well, Titanic was not built for speed. Titanic was built for safety and luxury. Uh, the really fast ships were called the Lusitania and the Mauritania. They'd been launched a few years earlier in 1907, and they had a service speed of 24 knots, which is nearly 30 miles an hour. So they were what they called the ocean greyhounds, and they were the ships that traded what we call the Blue Ribboned, which is an award for how fast a big ship can go across the Atlantic. But no, the Titanic with her sisters, the Olympic and originally planned the Gigantic, but was eventually launched as the Britannic, they were launched as a three service ship for reliability. So the idea was with Titanic that instead of having four propellers, like the very fast uh, other ships, she had three propellers only, but this meant she was more economic on fuel, and it also meant there was no vibration when she was going fast. So passengers remarked on how smooth Titanic was against her competitors. However, although Titanic wasn't racing for the blue ribbon, she wasn't trying to get the world record from Europe to America, um, what she was doing is she was having a little race with her twin sister called the Olympic, and this was a ship launched about a year before Titanic. And what they did there is they were monitoring how was Olympic progressing on her maiden voyage in 1911, and they were monitoring how was Titanic progressing on her maiden voyage in 1912, and they found Titanic's engines were smoother, Titanic was settling down quicker, and Titanic was going faster. Although Titanic's service speed was only 22 knots, we know that she actually reached a speed of 24 knots 
while she was going from her builders in Belfast around to Southampton. So we know she could go at least 24 knots. Now, when she actually collided with the iceberg, mercifully, you might say, she was actually only doing 22 knots. So she was not at full speed. And they were, in fact, uh, planning a full speed trial for Titanic the next day after she hit the iceberg. But of course, she went down in two hours and 20 minutes and there was no opportunity for a full speed test of Titanic. Had there been, it's likely she would have hit 25 knots as a top peak speed in the calm conditions that they had on her maiden voyage in the North Atlantic in April 1912. Why didn't the Titanic look out to have binoculars? Well, there's quite a simple explanation for this, and there's also quite a complicated explanation for this, but they're both quite interesting. So what happened was there was an officer uh, called David Blair, and he was supposed to be on the Titanic. He was due to be on the Titanic, but at the last minute, Captain Smith thought he wanted an officer with more experience of ships of the size of Titanic. Now, Blair had never been on the Olympic, this, who was a twin sister ship of Titanic, who was the same size. And he, Captain Smith, wanted people around him like First Officer Murdoch, like Second Officer Lightoller, who'd got experience with these supersized ships like the Olympic and Titanic. So he fired David Blair and David Blair had to go back to Ireland. And he was very disappointed about this. And in the sort of um, hullabaloo of him having to change his plans, and he was no doubt uh, somewhat, shall we say, discombobulated by what happened, he went away with the key of his cabin in his pocket. And the binoculars were kept in a drawer under his bed. And the keys he had with him included the key for the binoculars under his bed. And they were kept there when the Titanic was in port, so they wouldn't be stolen by anyone walking around when the ship was not going. Um, but the Titanic's uh, lookouts were due to have binoculars and they were a bit upset that actually there weren't binoculars um, left for them as there should have been. However, the more complicated answer is that having binoculars made no difference at all to what happened in the accident. And that's because the best way to spot ice at night is with the naked eye. And that's because the naked eye gives a wide field of vision and you can very easily pick up an iceberg or you should normally be able to easily pick up an iceberg with the naked eye. Then, what are binoculars for? Well, they're not for um, really detecting objects at night. What they're for is inspecting objects that you've already detected. And what the White Star didn't want is the lookouts thinking they saw ice and then getting the binoculars to decide if what it really was. What they wanted was three rings on the bell straight away as soon as they saw something ahead. And so binoculars would actually have slowed down the lookouts. And that's one of the reasons why they didn't supply their spare binoculars to the lookouts, because they knew that binoculars would not help at night to spot small icebergs, which is what they were looking out for. Could the Titanic have stayed afloat? Well, interestingly, yes, she could, because remember that she was allowed or designed to float with the first four compartments flooded. That means that Murdoch, who was in charge of Titanic at the time of the collision, he could have gone straight directly slap bang into the iceberg without trying to turn at all. And what that would have done is it would have squashed down the bow of Titanic and it would have decelerated the ship from 22 knots to zero in about 100 feet of like crumple zone, a bit like a in a car crash, a crumple zone. And then only four compartments would have been flooded and Titanic would have floated indefinitely. But of course, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And I think Murdoch would have been absolutely mad not to try and avoid the berg. In fact, he did avoid the berg with Titanic's bow, but that presented the valuable stern of Titanic with all the propeller shafts and engine rooms in it towards the berg. So what he then did, having given the order harder starboard to turn the ship to the left, he then gave the order harder port to turn the ship to the right to swing the stern clear of the berg, but that had the effect of actually running Titanic aground on the back of the iceberg. Did nearby ships think the distress flares were fireworks? Hmm, difficult question this one. Um, they were very confused about Titanic's distress flares and that's because there were very unusual things happening uh, optically and atmospherically the night the Titanic sank. In fact, ultimately, the sinking of the Titanic was caused by freak weather. 
and the freak weather was caused by what we call an ice flow, which is an enormous sheet of ice. Now, it's hard to imagine this, but actually in front of Titanic, about seven minutes steaming time away from the berg she bumped into, was in fact a solid piece of ice three miles deep and 75 miles long. You could have played football on it, you could have lit fires on it, you could have camped on it, you could have run around on it. Uh, there was no way to New York that night, but Titanic didn't know this. And um, the coldness of the ice surface meant that all of the air around that ice field was really, really cold. It was probably about minus two degrees. And yet nearby, there was the Gulf Stream, which was about 15 degrees. And not to go into too much scientific detail, but the differences in the air temperature caused light to bend unusually. And that meant there was a slight haze on the horizon, even though it was a perfectly clear night. And yet the lookout said that the berg was what they called a dark mass that came out of that haze. Now, in fact, we know the berg Titanic hit was white because when it came past the bridge, Titanic's light lit it up and it was seen to be white. But because it was a touch darker than the haze on the horizon, the lookouts initially thought it was a, a dark, or as the sailors called it, a blueberg. In terms of the distress flares, what that meant was these layers of air meant that the, the fireworks from, from Titanic, the distress rockets, they really couldn't be seen at the distance that Titanic was away from the nearby would-be rescue ship, the Californian, and in fact, they couldn't really be distinguished from the stars at that distance. However, remember we talked about the cold air over that ice. Well, that was magnifying things. It made Titanic look nearer than she actually was. And it made the rockets only be detected when they were low by the sea. And that meant that the officers watching it on the nearby ship, they thought, hmm, maybe they're just low-lying fireworks on the deck. You know, we're only seeing them very low. And tantalizingly, they did conclude that possibly they were coming from a ship further away. And in a way, that's true, because the Titanic was in fact much further away than she looked, but she was magnified in the cold air. And then, just in case anyone uh, needs to have their mind blown even more, just to say that, in fact, um, because Titanic appeared nearer but didn't appear longer, which is quite uh, uh, difficult to understand, it meant that they thought she was shorter. So because of the atmospheric conditions over the ice flow where Titanic crashed, she looked like a 400-foot ship five miles away, when in fact she was a 800-foot um, ship 10 miles away. Um, and there's even more tragedy compounded on that, which is that they had a map of which ships in the area had radio that night. And they knew on the Californian, this nearby ship, they knew that only the Titanic had radio that night near where they were. So when they looked at this ship that didn't seem like the biggest ship in the world 12 miles away, it seemed like a 400 foot ship only five miles away, they concluded that the ship they were looking at, A, was not the Titanic and B, did not have radio. And therefore, they decided not to wake their radio operator. So then what they did was they got the Morse lamp out and started morsing to each other, Titanic and Californian. But unfortunately, again, because of the atmospheric conditions and the stars appeared to be flashing, for example, because of the layers of air over the ice flow, what happened was that the sense was scrambled out of the flashing Morse lamp so they couldn't understand it. And then of course they went for the rockets and I've already explained why the rockets were very confusing because of the optics. Nevertheless, Captain Lord on the nearby Californian should have gone to the aid of the nearby vessel that was clearly in some sort of trouble. He decided not to because he had 50 passengers of his own. He was not insured to travel in ice and he knew it would be daylight in three or four hours and he felt they haven't got radio. They can't be bothered to reply to my Morse lamp. Their rockets are non-regulation. There's something strange. They're probably some foreign fishermen. I will investigate in daylight when it is safe to do so and when I'm not risking the lives of my own passengers. It was only the next morning when the radio operator woke up and gave him the news that the biggest ship in the world had sunk, that his hair literally went white overnight and he never got his hair colour back. And I think he spent the rest of his life regretting the decision that he made. But on the day, at the time, the decision he made is an entirely understandable one. So did the Titanic split in half? 
Well, yes it did. In fact, as the heavy bow filled with water and the buoyant stern with, with its watertight compartments was still floating up, imagine the forces between the two halves of the ship, the flooding half and the floating half. And what they did was they caused Titanic to break her back at about a 15 degree angle. So um, in, the, in the James Cameron film, which we've all seen from 1997, uh, you know, the ship was up like this before it cracked in half. In fact, Titanic cracked in half at about that angle. And um, Jack Thayer, uh, who was watching at the time, was not believed that it was uh, actually broken in half. But of course, when Bob Ballard found Titanic in September 1985, it was proved then that Titanic did break in half because the bow and the stern were quite a long way away because they actually sank at different times and kited in slightly different directions down towards the seabed of the North Atlantic, two miles down. How quickly did the Titanic sink? Well, mercifully, uh, she sank more slowly than they expected her to. So Thomas Andrews is the designer of the Titanic. He's on the ship at the time. And Captain Smith, the captain says, we've hit ice go down forward and review what's happened and time how fast the water is coming up the ladders and things and time how long the ship has got left. So Andrew's being cautious, investigated and decided that Titanic only had an hour and a half to live. In fact, she sank on an even keel so she could launch lifeboats on both sides, which is very unusual. And she actually took two hours and 20 minutes before she slipped beneath the waves. But even that, was not long enough to, or to launch all 20 lifeboats that Titanic had. She actually sank, dragging two lifeboats down with her, which then overturned, but they still saved people by having people on the bottom of the upturned lifeboats. Did the Titanic musicians continue to play? Yes and no. Uh, they all continued to play very bravely. Um, lively music, even comedy music from the popular musicals of the day as the um, lifeboats were being lowered. And because 95% of people who survived the Titanic disaster survived in the lifeboats, then 95% of survivors said the musicians played until the end. Well, that's because they did play uh, while all the lifeboats were being launched. The truth is though, that after the last lifeboats went away, the musicians in fact realized the seriousness of the situation. They went down to their cabins, they got their precious belongings, they strapped them to their backs, they took their shoes and socks off, and they jumped into the sea. And in fact, Wallace Hartley is the band leader, and his body was discovered with his violin strapped to his back that he played the last tunes on Titanic with, and that was recently sold in England uh, for a million pounds. Uh, and I was lucky enough to um, not buy it, uh, but to play it, and to actually um, feel like the musicians on the Titanic and, and how, how brave they were. Did the crew of the Titanic lock the passengers below deck? Again, yes and no. Um, the Titanic required by the Board of Trade that third class and second class passengers must be segregated. A bit like the recent sort of COVID-19 pandemic, they were very worried about the spread of infectious diseases. And they believed that third class might have had quite a lot of diseases and America didn't want that. So what they did is they said that you have to have metal gates closed while the ship's at sea between third class and second class. However, you were allowed to open the gates in an emergency. So here's what happened. Titanic struck ice at 11.40, 20 to 12, on the 14th of April, 1912. But by the time Thomas Andrews, the designer, had sounded the ship to find out how much damage was done, and by the time they worked out Titanic was gonna sink, and by the time they decided there was a state of emergency and they'd all have to evacuate, 47 minutes had elapsed. So during that time, some of the first class passengers, the men who were in the bow of the ship, because the women were in the stern of the ship, the single men were already with their belongings because they had water coming into their cabins. They knew Titanic was gonna sink, even probably more than Captain Smith knew at the first moments. So the third class were in fact locked below for 47 minutes, but after that, they were let out and in fact, um, first class and second class stewards were sent down to invite women and children from the third class and guide them up to the lifeboats. Sadly, 
in 1912, you were a man, a grown man, if you were more than 13 years old. So some of the large families in third class who had 13, 14, 15, 16 year old sons, they didn't want to leave them behind on a sinking ship. So those large families elected to stay together. Even so, more third class were saved from Titanic than second and first class. And in fact, third class passengers were more likely to survive than second class passengers. Um, but in total, 1,500 people drowned, including 50 children. And most of the children who, who died were in third class. Why didn't the Titanic have enough lifeboats? Well, there's quite a good reason why the Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats. Um, in fact, in order to have enough lifeboats to save everyone on a ship, because in 90% of occasions, if not more, ships do something called listing, which means tipping or leaning. And basically, it, it, if the ship's leaning like this, you can imagine, you can launch these lifeboats here, but the ones here on the high side of the ship, you can't launch them because they will scrape down the side of the ship to an extent that they just don't run and they won't launch. In order for Titanic to have had enough lifeboats for everyone on board in a normal listing, sinking situation, she'd have had to have enough lifeboats for everyone on the starboard side and enough lifeboats for everyone on board on the port side as well. And of course, that would be ridiculous. Um, so what the Board of Trade wanted was, instead of lots of unsafe ships that were improperly subdivided, piled high with lifeboats that made the ship tender or unstable, and that there was not enough crew to launch, and where there would never be enough time to launch that many lifeboats anyway in most sinking situations. No, what they wanted instead was really well-built ships like Titanic Titanic, really well subdivided like Titanic, and to have just enough lifeboats to launch and man, and to act as ferries, little ferries, to go from a stricken Titanic to a nearby rescue ship. And in 1912, the lanes of the Atlantic were like extensions of the railway line down to Plymouth. And there were lots of ships coming along all the time. And so the idea of the lifeboats was not to have a load of passengers in little lifeboats on the North Atlantic, which would be very unsafe. They were designed to just be enough to transship people to rescue. Did the Titanic have a women and children first policy? Yes and no. They did decide to say women and children first. This was a tradition that had come about because of a previous sinking about 20 years earlier. However, Murdoch, who was in charge of Titanic at the time of the collision, he took the right hand side of Titanic, which is called the starboard side. And he allowed women and children in, but if they were with men or there were men there and no other women to hand, he would just fill the boats. So he was quite happy to take men after he'd taken in all the women and children that were nearby the boats. Uh, however, first officer, second officer Lightoller, who was the most senior surviving officer, he was handling the boats on the left-hand side of the Titanic called the port side. And he was very strict about it. He said, women and children only. In fact, one man actually uh, put a lady's hat on his teenage son and said, there you are, now he's a girl and he can go. And that's where the myth came about that people dressed as women uh, to be saved from Titanic, which is uh, a, fake, a fake myth. So the answer is, did it have a women and children first policy? Yes, but it had a no men in the lifeboats policy on the left-hand side and a men allowed in the lifeboats policy on the right hand side. So the next question, why were the Titanic lifeboats not full? Well, this is a very good question. Um, first of all, the Titanic didn't believe that it had enough time left to launch all the lifeboats that it had. The designer Thomas Andrews thought that it only had an hour and a half to live. So they wanted to get the lifeboats in the water and fill them more from the water. The other reason is the officers of Titanic wrongly believed that the new ropes that were attaching the new lifeboats to the ship might actually snap if they launched the lifeboats fully down the side of the ship. So they thought to avoid risk, they should partly, partly fill them, then lower that weight down with the ropes and then fill the ships properly from gangway doors in the hull and fill them more safely and less nerve-wrackingly for the passengers. There's another reason as well. Um, there's little cranes on the side of Titanic called davits and they held all the lifeboats out over the side of the ship and some of those davits were twin davits. In other words, they could release two lifeboats but only one at a time. So 
the smaller lifeboats were actually launched first almost completely empty so that they would be able to properly launch and fill the fuller boats afterwards. So it was all to do with saving as much time as possible and trying to rescue as many people as they could uh, within the time available. Now in, in the event, Titanic lasted longer than they thought. Titanic actually lasted two hours and 20 minutes. However, nevertheless, the, she still didn't have time to launch all the lifeboats she had. She launched 18, leaving two in the davits, which actually got dragged down as the ship sank. Another reason why they weren't full is that they had up to eight oars each, and those oars needed room to swing. Because if you're on the North Atlantic and you're rowing to safety, and you're so full of people that you can't move the oars, Everyone's going to die anyway when the swell gets up and the waves come over the side of the lifeboat. Um, another reason was that it was a very cold night. People were told to wear life jackets. People were wearing motoring coats, fur coats, hats, gloves. They were much bigger than the Board of Trade reckoned people were when they calculated it back in their, in their offices in London. So um, a combination of factors is why the lifeboats were launched not full. How many people died on the Titanic? Well, this is not known. <laughs> um, it was a bit chaos in Southampton when the Titanic left, and they didn't know exactly who was on board. Some people were on with fake names. Some people decided not to take the ship at the last minute. Some people were on who weren't expected to travel. Um, but the consensus is about 1,500 people died on the Titanic, and about 705 people were saved from Titanic, um, but we will never know precisely what the number was. Did they die of hypothermia or drowning? Good question. Um, half and half. Um, some of them drowned, uh, tragically, by being tugged under and pulled under by people who were trying to save themselves. Um, but the vast majority of them did, in fact, perish from hypothermia. Uh, it was minus two degrees, uh, so it was below freezing, which is hard to understand because the water was still liquid, but it was below freezing. And what it meant was that people could only survive a maximum of 20 minutes in the water until they would black out. They would basically go into, um, I think it's called mammalian shock, which is where your, uh, all the blood goes from your extremities to your vital organs, your heart slows down, and you go into a, a sort of hibernation state, if you like, and that is the state in which they were left. Um, in fact, nowadays with modern technology, um, we could have warmed them up very slowly and saved a lot of those lives. But in those days, they just thought they were dead. In that sense, they of course did drown, but actually there was no water in their lungs. Next question. Did the Titanic captain go down with the ship? Yes, he, he absolutely did. Captain Smith was extremely brave. Um, he had a 14-year-old daughter at home. He was soon due to retire. I don't think he could believe the situation that he was in, having never had a very serious accident at sea. But he kept it together. He kept it calm. He tried to evacuate the ship as quickly as possible. Um, but one thing he did do after all the lifeboats had gone is he went bravely around his men working on the lifeboats and quietly dismissed them basically saying it's every man for himself. Because there is a moment when a ship is lost, when the crew no longer have that duty. In fact, some people think that a captain cannot survive a shipwreck, and that's actually not true. Captains are allowed to survive shipwrecks, provided they stay on the ship until the last minute. And Captain Smith did exactly that. He eventually took a header dive off the bow as Titanic was engulfed by a wave. The wave, by the way, was caused by the Titanic sinking suddenly more quickly. That's what created the wave. There was no waves on the actual sea that night. And then he swam around and he tried to rescue a baby and he clung onto a lifeboat, but he succumbed to hypothermia and cold in the night, as you might expect, because he was a, a, a much older man than most of the people who actually survived from the water. So he did go down with the ship. And for example, um, the captain of the Lusitania, which was sunk in the First World War, um, actually he survived and he was rescued and um, lived to uh, an older age, Captain Turner. Um, so Captain Smith intended to survive. He was trying to survive on one of the lifeboats. Had he stayed alive until Carpathia had rescued them, he would have survived and he wouldn't have been criticized for surviving. But he did, yes, go down with the ship and he did, of course, die in the tragedy. Could Jack have fit on the door? 
Uh, great question. Um, first of all, I'm not absolutely convinced it's a door. I think it's a large piece of oak panelling from the uh, first class uh, stairway. Um, but whether it was a door or not, yes, he could have fitted on it because it was physically big enough for him and Rose to lie side by side, a bit like the size of a double bed or something. But here's the thing. If Jack had climbed onto that door or whatever piece of floating wood it was with Rose, they would have both been a bit lower in the water and been in contact with the water. Now, being in contact with the water for a long period of time when Titanic sank meant death. So what I think Jack did is he avoided getting on, even though there was room for him, in order that the piece of wood would float high enough out of the water to keep Rose dry enough to have a chance of survival. How were the survivors of the Titanic treated? Well, they were treated very well in a sense that they were uh, on Carpathia. The passengers gave up their cabins for them. So they were given, you know, third class were given first class cabins, for example. They were given brandy when they arrived. They were given hot tea. They were given lots of food, warm blankets. So in that way, all the survivors were very well treated. But in actuality, there was a great stigma, wrongly around men who survived. Because so many women and children drowned on the Titanic, people regarded men who survived with suspicion. How, how did you get in? You must have rushed a boat. You must have bribed someone to get on. In fact, the men who survived were even either invited to go into a lifeboat or they were just at the right place at the right time. A very famous second class survivor called Lawrence Beasley was just standing in a part of the deck where there wasn't, bizarrely, where there wasn't much activity and there was space and he was welcomed and stepped into the boat. In fact, the passengers were horrified when a load of third class flooded up right towards the end after most of the lifeboats had left. They had no idea. They believed that all the women and children had got off until this flood of humanity came up nearer the end. So there we are, so that answers your questions. If you've got any other questions, uh, please like, please subscribe, and we'll be happy to answer them.